We are talking to uh, Professor Andrew Hickey today. Uh, Professor uh, Andrew Hickey is uh, working at the, the, uh, uh, the School of Humanities and Communication at the University of Southern Queensland. Um, he's an associate professor and uh, he was also the former president of the Cultural Studies Association of Australasia. And uh, usually his research explores community formation and uh, public pedagogy's place. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for joining with us. Um, it's a pleasure having you here. Uh, pleasure to be here, about, Absolutely. Um, pleasure. Yeah, to talk about um, the, the scene of the humanities uh, in Australia and uh, particularly in, in, uh, in your context. Um, Andrew, uh, we, will, we will start the discussion uh, by just first uh, setting the context uh, for the discussion. Um, how do you how do you see the crisis in the humanities in Australia in particular, and also its impact on a university uh, like yours? Um, we will start from there. Look, it, it's it's an interesting moment as it is globally at the moment, and and you know, uh, it, yeah, every, everyone is aware of the impact that COVID nineteen has had, but there's a, a, a really interesting and ironic, I think, uh, inflection of that in Australia currently at the moment, in that the impact of COVID-19 from a perspective of health hasn't been as significant as it is, say, in places like the United States or certainly the UK and Britain, uh, and also India and the subcontinent. You know, so from a health perspective, cases are relatively low here, um, and, and, and certainly the impact of that hasn't, hasn't been as stark as other parts of the world. The social and economic impact, however, has mm -hmm. been you know, fairly significant. And again, as it has been in other parts of the world as well. But what we've seen here are you know, state and regional lockdowns occurring um, in order to sort of you know, contain COVID-19. But most significantly, the closing of the border. And mm -hmm. as with other parts of the world as well, but the closing of the border, the impact that this has had in Australia in terms of higher education has been in terms of students and student mobility. And so when we've got a university edu a higher education system uh, in Australia that is that is fairly heavily dependent on overseas students, mm -hmm. um, our domestic market is, is vibrant and, and significant, of course, but our overseas market is, is a, a fair portion of where a lot of our student cohorts come from. Mm -hmm. So with closing these borders, this has had a major impact. And... So this is the context. So people use this concept of the perfect storm. Um, it's not a, not a phrase that I particularly like, but all, all of these things have come together at once and have exposed perhaps some of the design issues with the way that higher education in Australia is currently formulated. So we've got closed borders. We've got you know cohorts of students who can't get into the country from overseas. Mm -hmm. At the same time that we have uh, what could arguably be described as an antagonistic government. Um, mm -hmm who isn't particularly fond of higher education institutions and universities in particular. And um, I, I might talk some more about this in a second, just some, some observations on that. But mm -hmm. those three factors coming together have, have really given us some pause for thought. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand that you're someone who works in the field of uh, cultural studies, uh, interestingly, and, uh, you know, uh, and also with the, the, cur the curriculum and pedagogy. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, let's let's actually talk about your involvement uh, in the field, your engagement in the field of cultural studies, um, by uh, talking about how important it is, um, uh, you know, to have critical pedagogy uh, in in a in a field like the humanities and social sciences. How important is critical pedagogy for us? Well, the first response is it's crucial, of course, and and. <laughs> You know, we, we, we hear this, humanity scholars will always say that. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of generic skills that we in the humanities and particularly in cultural studies like to believe that we have and are able to, you know, encourage our students into gaining and, and working mm -hmm. through uh, include, you know, you know, critical capacities, in, in, you know, you know uh, capacities for higher order thought and, and creativity and all those sorts of ubiquitous things that we often hear. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they are important, of course, but they become a little bit hackneyed. And my concern is that when we talk about these things, we tend to limit the range of what it is a, a, a good student or scholar in cultural studies and the humanities is actually capable of. And 
So we, we see this wheeled out quite a bit, and there's several reports around circulating around at the moment. For instance, you know, a recent one from Deloitte's, the Economic um, and Mapping and Modelling Agency here in Australia, who, you know, have been providing reports to government saying that look, you know, good humanities and arts graduates have these critical capacities, and they make good employees because they're creative and yeah, 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 yeah all of that sort of stuff. And that's fine. That is important. You know, absolutely. But I think there's something we, we miss in those arguments. And I think it's a little bit more crucial to being human, actually. And it's mm -hmm. around perhaps questions of ethics. That, you know, something that, that students that we encounter in our disciplines mm -hmm. are actively encouraged to think about uh, ethics of self, ethics yeah. of other, you know, how relationality works, uh, how one might actually then sort of, you know, predispose a critical disposition towards that sort of thinking, mm -hmm. and then how an ethical engagement with community and society might actually function as well. And mm -hmm. so that, 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 I think, is the virtue of the humanities, but it seems to be also its curse, because mm -hmm. it seems to be also those factors and values that, you know, some of the critics of the humanities are going after at the moment as well. And... You know, I, I get concerned when they're cast and characterised as being soft skills because they're not. They're actually crucial to being human. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a complex interplay, I think, because it's precisely those things that I think critics of universities, perhaps the right-wing media, perhaps certain brands of government and politics, um, they attack those things as somehow being you know, soft or not valuable yeah. when, in fact, I think they're probably crucial because uh, they cause folks to actually think and start to consider things a little bit and perhaps that might be where the real problem is. Mm, absolutely. Um, I, I understand that you also teach uh, to a predominantly first-generation uh, group of students at your university, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in moving uh, their response to a field like cultural studies, for example. Um, especially, you know, um, in my understanding, in, uh, in my uh, part of the world, it, cultural studies can be a break away from the traditional or conventional English studies, right? Um, how, how do how do uh, how do students respond to, you know, um, uh, cultural studies as a field and its prospects and future prospects for them? Look, this is interesting. I, I'm in a, in a perhaps a, a somewhat different perspective to perhaps a, a lot of my colleagues in that I work in a regional university as well. So, and as you know, uh, a lot of our students um, uh, are first in family, um, first exposure to university. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there is, there is that cultural capital uh, that perhaps may not be there with some of our students with regard to higher education and what university you know, education requires. Yeah. But what we tend to find is is that, you know, and and... My colleagues, you know, and, and folks working in the humanities will, will probably recognise this, but mm -hmm. we tend to find within that first year, students come back to us and sort of say, you've given me a language for things I knew were happening but couldn't explain. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that I think, for me, is, is you know, a, a major marker of significance for what cultural studies does. Mm -hmm. It provides that language. It provides that way of talking about experiences, you know, phenomenologies of being, mm -hmm. uh, particularly at this point in human history and, and certainly in, in locations like Australia where there are fairly stark social, economic and, you know, uh, health implications for, you know, what's going on at the moment. Yeah. So to provide that critical capacity for people to be able to think through and talk about and, you know, discuss those things they feel on the pulse, as Stuart Hall would have said, you know, can now put those into words. That's what a good cultural studies, you know, uh, engagement does, especially in the first year. Yeah. It gives you that language. And, look, from there on in, you know, what we tend to do within our degree after that and depending on where the students then start to specialise, you know, and so I, I teach cultural studies through communications and media studies, and while closely aligned, they are distinct fields, of course, but so we sort, we're sort of getting cultural studies in through the back door somewhat, you know, but it provides us with that critical agency to be able to not only sort of decode and read the media formations and communication formations that circulate around us, but to actually then start to infuse that ethics that I, I mentioned before as well, you know, Yep, sure, we can decode these particular things that circulate, these, these mediations all around us. But then to ask questions around what does it mean to engage with that as a human being? How do I start to understand and recognise myself and others through those things? That's what cultural study does. And that, that, that's foundational to its purpose. Like if we go back to, to Raymond Williams and, you know, th those, those early foundations, you know, uh, Williams and Hoggart in particular, 
that you know critical pedagogy was core to that project in cultural studies. We need to remember that because not only was it just about sort of this this process of sort of deciphering and or, you know translating what's going on, mm-hmm. but it's actually then more crucial around explaining why these things are working, how they sort of engage in or or motivate practices of selfhood and and self-making and how it is we then start to, you know, think a little bit more proactively around futures and possible, uh, um, um, you know, and alternative narratives in going forward, you know, where where do we then take this? Yeah, yeah. I remember there was an article uh, written by you on the the place and purpose of cultural studies uh, in, in, you know, you, you title it as the persistence of cultural studies, a brief consideration of the place and purpose of cultural studies in an otherwise turbulent world. Yeah, that was an interesting article and uh, it made me think uh, a lot about, you know, um, the place of cultural studies and its potential. It's, uh, you know, um, it's training for students, um, actually. Um, what like still we are on the, since we are still on the subject of cultural studies, what potentials and what uh, limitations do you see in the field um, in order to train students, especially first generation students, you know, in, in, in different you know uh, aspects of world making, you know, uh, what what kind of potentials and limitations do you see? Look, the main thing I think is that there's there's a couple of layers to this, of course, and. Perhaps at the um, you know at, at, at a very very generic level, you know, there, there is a fundamental crisis going on currently with the way that humanities are received and understood, um, and that's that's not just you know uh, within Australia; uh, it seems to be globally that there, there, there seems to be this bizarre resistance to the humanities in some regards, mm-hmm. and certainly if we can characterise in very broad brush terms the right wing media. You know, whatever that is, but but you know, this that that perhaps you know, ilk of media, mm-hmm. you know, ab- absolutely antagonistic towards what it is we do. See, see what it is that humanities and cultural studies scholars do as as very soft, as as sort of indulgent, as wasting taxpayers' dollars. You know, we, we've got a you know notable bevy of right wing commentators in Australia at the moment who every time you know Australian Research Council grants are announced. You know, straight onto them uh, to sort of attack them, so say this is what public money has been spent on, and what an outrage! You know, so there's that that sort of layer of the discourse. More intrinsically within the university as well, I think that there's still a patent misunderstanding about what it is that humanities, cultural studies, communications, media studies, this, this yeah. you know, broad ilk of disciplines. Yeah what it means. And, you know, I I find from my own direct experience attending sort of university level management meetings, you know, particularly with regard to research and scholarship, Mm -hmm. a a fundamental misunderstanding about what it is humanities academics do, uh, why it is they're doing that work and and of what value that is. And that that, that really problematic concept of value becomes a a fraught concept as well. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps in terms of uh, the perspective or context of community, I think there's a misunderstanding again. Mm -hmm. Now, to this, this, this I think, is the challenge for teaching uh, undergraduate students especially, Mm -hmm. many of whom will be coming from backgrounds where their choices of university study have been criticised and perhaps, Mm -hmm. you know, dismissed. Mm -hmm. And so to have a student in this day and age uh, attend university already unsure, not entirely confident with their capacities to do this. They don't have the cultural capital with them to be able to necessarily sort of navigate immediately. Um, And on top of that, perhaps having their friends and family networks tell them that, oh, gee whiz, you've chosen an arts degree, what are you doing? Um, Yeah, we we need to be circuit breakers there. So not only do we need to be good pedagogues, we need to, uh, you know, actively engage and teach this stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, 110% 110% well, yeah. but we also need to advocate for our disciplines. And so something we do here at USQ quite a bit um, is really ensure that our students um, understand why it is they're, they're learning what they're learning, that there, there is a, a very apparent curriculum, and yeah. that's, that's good pedagogical practice. I know there's nothing particularly startling in that, but, but that is a foundation. But within which, you know, very, very clear generative themes, as Ira Shaw would have once called these, you know, this this connection to the so-called real world. Yeah. Where again, wherever that is. But but so the students can see these connections that here is this sort of body of knowledge mm-hmm. that has amenity for explaining the experiences they're having. 
and that's where I think the real power of cultural studies is because it is it is humanistic in its reach in that regard. Mm -hmm. What it actively intends to do is provide an explanation okay. to say this is how the world works. Here is one particular way of understanding those mm -hmm. workings. Mm -hmm. And here in particular is a, a modality for thinking through futures and mm -hmm. alternative narratives. And that's a crucial bit, providing students with a way to think ahead as well, to sort of say, well, okay, we're not just engaged in processes of decipherment or decoding, we're actually also imagining future narratives here, and that's crucial. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about your, uh, your research engagement now. Uh, like when we had our first uh, conversation, you, you talked about how you're engaged in, um, you know, public policy and pedagogy and all that. Uh, and we'll talk about it a bit more. Sure. Yes. Um, look. Look. It's look. My, my personal um, perspective on this, and, ju and just just a personal perspective. Um, I, look, I, I think you know, particularly in a regional setting such as mine, yeah. um, it's incumbent on people like me to engage closely with with my most immediate communities. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of my research work does just that. So I'm, I'm engaged heavily with um, our local government here in Toowoomba, um, where my campus is, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been been working. With, with local government for many years now, decades in fact. But within that in, in particular with uh, in, in the community engagement and community development space within our local government. So I collaborate quite closely with the community development officers and, and that branch of local government. Uh, with the focus then specifically around youth. So my particular specialisation is on, on youth engagement and um, youth community and capacity building. Um, and so look, it's been a wonderful partnership, uh, really, you know, mutually beneficial. Um, it's also taught me as well that we as academics need to think very clearly about our ethics of yeah. conduct and mm -hmm. how does we actually go about doing our work. And I often see uh, academics, you know, sometimes not always, you know, new to the field, you know, coming in as expert, trying to be the expert, trying to, you know, sort of, you know, appraise and, and update and, and inform you know, otherwise unknowing publics uh, in terms of where they're going wrong. No, that, that is not our role at all. And, you know, to, to more genuinely partner, to more genuinely provide a, a, a very clear skill set in what it is we do as academics, that then informs, that, that you know, collaborates with and act actively, you know, sort of, you know, enhances uh, those communities that we're working with. But with a clear and sort of discernible sense that we don't have all the answers, mm -hmm. that becomes fairly important. So with, with a recent example, you know, I was involved in, in authoring a youth strategy for our local government here in Toowoomba. Uh -huh. And, you know, so with a background in cultural studies, with, with sociological research method skills, whatever else, we're able to conduct a, a fairly major, in fact, the, the first major study of young people in the Toowoomba region mm -hmm. that then informed the development of that policy for local government. So mm -hmm. that, that, for me, I think, stands as not a bad model for doing things, that there is a skill set that we as academics have. We can produce certain types of, of understanding, certain types of information, that can be mobilised then in certain ways for ends like youth strategies and uh, charting some, some process and policy for uh, local government. Mm -hmm. uh, we could also move on to uh, your classroom, uh, how, um, how these kind of practices that you, you know, um, that, you, that you're engaged in out, like, sort of outside the classroom, how does it help you know, to develop your pedagogy, to approach students, especially youth, uh, and you know, to, to be more more responsive to uh, to the you know uh, to the context or the situations that they come come from. Uh, how does it mutually benefit your you know practice as an academic? Well, look, there's, there's relevance from, from a very instrumental perspective. Um, <laughs> there's just that basic relevance. I get to brag about those things that I do, you know, so it's, it's and it, it provides the students with a sense then that I might actually know what I'm doing, you yeah. know, if I, can, if I can produce, you know, uh, um, copies of documentation like, like youth policies or indeed have yeah. those uh, partners that I'm working with in local government visit my classrooms. Yeah. Um, that provides the students with a sense that, ah, Okay, so here is one particular way that this 
theory, this this knowledge, what we're learning here right. could be used. So that right. that sort of illustrates for the students that that there is some some you know, purpose behind what it is they're learning, mm -hmm. uh, and beyond me just sort of you know telling them that it's important, they mm -hmm. start to see then that there is application here. Now the nice thing is I I, I tend to work with my later undergrad students and certainly with my PhD students, uh -huh. I'm, I'm really, really active in getting those guys involved in those projects as well. So there's that, that sort of practical edge to this stuff for them. Mm -hmm. It also builds their skills as scholars, as, as burgeoning scholars, you know, particularly when it comes to writing grant applications or putting together consultancy agreements and those sorts of things. They're good skills to have. But more importantly, though, it gets these guys actively involved in actually working at the chalk face with the community. Um, so, so my students can start to see then that, look, yeah, again, he, you know, th there is this way of thinking, this way of being that a cultural studies, a humanities education will provide, but here's now how it can be mobilised. And it's, it's on that front that I, I, I take some cues from Stuart Hall, you know, the, the, the great cultural studies scholar, Stuart Hall, and... Yeah. yeah, particularly where that notion of translation that he talked about, that we need to be able to sort of translate what it is we do okay. for those communities that we're working with. So that, that's the broad ethos by which I work. Mm -hmm. um, is, is how, how is your university, or we'll talk about your department, uh, facilitate students who have, who have had no prior exposure to higher education setting? Uh, you know, how, how, how do you facilitate the entry and ease their passage into the into your department? Um, because uh, we, we also uh, will be talking about this uh, in, in a future episode um, regarding, you know, how such such departments can be, especially in the Sri Lankan context, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about, you know, in, in Sri Lanka, some departments can be very uh, distant. For, uh, for these first generation students uh, who have no cultural capital at all, like you said. Yeah. Um, and then there is assumption that, you know, they have to have this prior set of knowledge, skills in order to, you know, come to these departments and, you know, engage the learning process. How do you facilitate this kind of, you know, passage to students? There's, there's a couple of things we do at USQ and we, we've got, and, and this is by no means unique, um, there are variations of this in, in a lot of universities, of course, but we have um, what we call the Head Start program at USQ, which enables uh, years 10, 11 and 12 students to undertake a foundational course um, of study uh, mm -hmm. and to gain a credit point. Uh, for entry into to the university. So that, that, that's a highly facilitated process then. So where we get to work closely with these students to sort of yeah, work them through that initial course that introduces them not only to university study and scholarship more broadly, but yeah. particularly to what it is we do in the humanities. And the, now, one of the interesting you know, outcomes of that has been not so much that, you know, how, how we've now learnt to engage with students in this way and to, and to as you say, facilitate that bridge through, but more particularly how that has then confronted some of the stereotypes that circulate yeah. around humanities. And yeah. as I was saying before, that you know, oftentimes we, we have students, you know, when we're out doing school engagement, you know, initiatives and, and meeting with prospective students, that certainly during open day and those sorts of events, students will express to us a desire that they, you know, they, they've really enjoyed English or they've really enjoyed media or geography or history or whatever it happens to be at school and they want to sort of follow that through. Yeah. But there's an anxiety around that because mum and dad are telling them they need to go and do something that's employable or they've had a teacher tell them something similar or, you know, and, and, and the, the broad sort of, you know, sentiment of society as well is, is, I think, in some ways geared against what it is we do. So, yeah, that, that, that's a challenge. I think that's something that we haven't as, as representatives of our disciplines and as a field generally. I don't think we've actually confronted that overly well i think that's something that we need to do more often and mm -hmm. you know certainly through you know professional associations but i think individually uh -huh. what we probably need to be doing as academics is making sure that we are in fact visible and out there okay. that we're, we're not reducing our our work down to very instrumental demonstrations of, of practicality mm -hmm. not to do that but yeah to still be visible and to say, no, no, there is a purpose and a place for what it is we do. It's ultra important. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in this day and age, right here, right now, in this point in human history, what it is we do is probably fairly crucial, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps we need to be listening less to some other discipline experts and more to humanities people if we're hoping to keep this whole enterprise going a little bit longer. 
you know. So that would be my take on this. But I think that's incumbent on us as a field. I think we, we need to engage that dialogue a little bit more deliberately and perhaps a little bit more directly with our communities because I'm concerned that we're being misunderstood not only at a political level, not only in terms of the commentariat within some aspects of the media, um, but perhaps most crucially, I think we're being misunderstood at a community level. And that's a worry. That's a real worry. Yeah, yeah. I would also like to know um, uh, about, you know, there is this huge uh, kind of uh, emphasis on uh, rethinking the humanities, the need to rethink our field, right? Um, I would like to know, uh, um, you know, taking your context into regard and any academic debates so, or, you know, conversations into regard, uh, how do you look at this? Um, this idea of rethinking, the need to rethink, reimagine the humanity, especially at you know at the, the present context. Look, my first response to Lenny is to weep. Um, I. I, I... <laughs> I, um, I I break down in tears most times when I think about this, but look, I think there's, uh, th this is a really poignant question, actually, because actually at, at, at my university right now, we're going through a, uh, a re-accreditation process where we're asking exactly these questions. Mm -hmm. What are the purposes of our Bachelor of Arts and what are the purposes of our Bachelor of Communication degree? So, you know, we're, we're, we're right in the thick of this. And it's just fascinating from a, a, a centralised university level, there's this uh, common mantra uh, again, which is not unique to USQ, a lot of universities are, are facing this, but this common mantra around employability. Yeah. And so, you know, every decision we now make has to be made in terms of employability. You know, there's this this constant sort of, you know, again, a mantra, you know, it, it's it's every corner you get around, there's someone saying employability. Yeah. So, and, and look, that's that's fair enough. I, I, I get that. And it's interesting, you know, in, in some quarters of the humanities, that's almost an anathema to what the sort of the, the you know, sine qua non is seen as being, you know, that, that somehow perhaps, you know, some of us in the humanities think that we're, we're not about that, we're, we're somehow different to concerns of, of employability, that we're into higher order thinking and creativity and all those wonderful things. And Yeah, sure, that's there. I, I think we need a clearer narrative on this as well. While we haven't actually sold our message particularly well, I don't think, to communities, I don't think we've sold our message particularly well to a lot of employers either. And this, in response to this sort of general push for employability, because when you start to dig into it, of course, what employability actually means is really quite defined and specific. And it gets down to largely uh, a, a very, very small set of instrumental skills that graduates are meant to have. Um, and that then it presumably makes them employable and presumably they, get, they go and get wonderful middle-class jobs and pay taxes and do what good voting people should do, you know. Yeah. So, you know, that I think is a really limited argument. And I think we, we, we have so much capacity within the humanities to broaden that argument out, to say, well, hang on, let's first of all question this idea of employability and widen the reach. Yeah. Let's say, hang on a second, rather than having a very narrow and instrumentalist set of skills that correspond with that idea, we start to broaden this a little bit and start to then in, incorporate questions of self and happiness and fulfilment. You know, wonderful sort of you know, dangerous and crazy ideas that they are, but, but we start talking about graduates who are not only able to think, but who are fulfilled and happy and who will, you know, become active members of the community. Yeah. If we can start to broaden this out a little bit and challenge those views, then I think we'll be on a winner. Uh, but it's 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 a real challenge at the moment because university central university you know management and, and executive tend to sort of work with this this very very simple and simplistic understanding of what these skill sets that graduates should have are, uh -huh. which then sort of filter down through degree programs right down to individual tutorials and lectures, mm -hmm. and I think that's a real threat to what it is we do because I think it washes out the value of the humanities. Mm -hmm. It washes out and starts to emphasise something that actually isn't all that core per se to what it is we do, mm -hmm. but not to say that what we do traditionally has been sort of, you know, relegated or somehow is no longer important. I just think we need to reframe that narrative and, and remind ourselves of what actually is crucial within a humanities education and that, that is, that's valuable to society as well. Mm -hmm. Andrew, um, we will just, you know, move on to something totally different. And let's talk about uh, what, kind of on a very personal level, what motivated you to sort of be um, 
uh, you know, uh, or pursue um, a field like this, the humanities, rather than, you know, um, moving on with, with something more, you know, which the society demands. Um, is it your, is it your upbringing? Is it, did you have any exposure to this kind of, you know, alternative ways of thinking about the world? Or what, what, what actually motivated you to, um, you know, pursue this? All those things, for me. Um, look, yeah. I, I came from a very modest, modest background, um, and um, it, it's without. It's all very cliche to say that. Look, you know, I I, I teach kids who remind me of me. Uh, no, none of that. I'm, it, it's not not that hackneyed or cliche by any means. Yeah. But but I, I certainly grew up in a very modest background where there were things going on around me, and I was looking out into the world and sort of seeing a whole heap of sort of you know inconsistency and contradiction, and I couldn't quite explain it and. Luckily for me, I, I encountered a, a teacher in high school, an English teacher, who sort of said, you should go and do humanities at university. And I had no idea. I, I literally had no idea that this was something that was possible. You know, yeah. I'm first in family to university. Um, you know, so, so my cultural capital was, was exceptionally low and vague when it came to what happened at university. I knew you could do engineering and I knew you could do accounting and law at university because I, I you know, knew of some lawyers, accountants and engineers and they told me that they'd been to university. So I knew that that was it, but I didn't know you could do all this other wonderful stuff. And so I'm just so thankful for that English teacher because of saying, you should go and do this because you have capacity in it. And so I went and found out about this and, and enrolled in a Bachelor of Arts. And, you know, I remember, you know, and this is all very cliched as well, so just forgive me on this, but, but I remember on my first day sort of feeling that I was now at home. You know, I found my people. You know, here were people who were talking about things that I recognised and that, that felt on the pulse were important. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, I was now being provided that language to be able to speak about these things. So that was crucial. And so it's fairly early on in my undergrad degree, I uh, majored in English literature, uh, history and sociology. And uh, I was very, very fortunate, I didn't realise it at the time, but I was very, very fortunate to be, be taught by people in English literature who are actually cultural studies scholars. And, you know, it's, it's a you know, formative time for cultural studies in Australia as well as the early 1990s. And so there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on. Um, and I had exposure to that as an undergrad student. So I'm just so fortunate to have encountered those people. Mm -hmm. And it was soon on, it was around second year, I thought, I want to do this. I, I want to be an academic. And, right. you know, but then, then, then so a, a pragmatic concern entered my mind. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, but jobs are scarce. And, oh, geez, you know, I, I don't know how I'd go, whatever else. But, but lo and behold, you know, Several years later, I did an honours degree as well following that and, and moved on and, and finally a, a PhD later on and secured an academic position and have been absolutely, you know, just, just in awe of this career ever since. It, it, there's not a day goes by where I don't wake up and pinch myself and think, wow, this is just just so wonderful that I have this opportunity to encounter the students that I encounter, to work with my, my PhD students, to work with my colleagues to be able to engage in this sort of thinking, to, to engage in, you know, and, 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 you know, respond to questions that have world significance. Yeah. That's, that's such a privilege, such a privilege, you know. And so it's that that I want to sort of, you know, relay to my students as well to sort of say that, look, you know, this is why you're doing humanities because what you do is actually responding to those questions that are global and that are timeless, that, that the, these are major and fundamental human questions that we're responding to here. So, and most of them get that energy. Most of them understand that as well. So, it's, um, so that's how I came to academia and why I do this. Absolutely. Um, uh, we, will, we will also tell your students, especially those who are in Australia or in like, you know, in, in your part of the uh, world, like in New Zealand, Australia, uh, students who are, you know, who are eager to uh, do humanities but are very reluctant to, you know, take that radical step ahead. Uh, what kind of, what kind of message would you give those students? Especially, um, how would you reassure them uh, in terms of, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and then their decision? It's a, it's a really interesting logic at play here in Australia at the moment. Um, in that, in that antagonism I was talking about before from yeah. some, some quarters of the media and certainly yeah. some, some branches of politics yeah. has, has provided this sort of you know, public sentiment that the humanities are not as important as other areas. Yeah. And that the message that's certainly coming through um, centrally through, through particular policy enactments 
federally here in Australia at the moment, yeah. is that, look, you know, you don't want to study humanities because you won't be employable and valuable. That's the, sort of the, the core of the message. But if you go and study nursing or engineering or sciences, technologies, you will be valuable. Yeah. And not denying that. You know, you know people who, who study STEM areas, science, nursing, engineering, of course, they're important too. Yeah. But it's a very, very divisive argument. Of course, you know, and that, that's the intention, I think, unfortunately. I think that this antagonism plays out in terms of that divisiveness of this message. So in that context, you know, it's crucial that we let students know actually that, or prospective students in particular know that, that no, hang on, what you are doing is crucial. Yeah. What you are doing is valuable. You, you are, again, responding to those world questions that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. that this is a, a noble, fundamental and, and absolutely significant field of, of inquiry and well mm. worth studying. But here's the irony. When you look at the number of reports, there, there's, there's you know, dozens of them now. The British Council in the UK, um, the Academy for Social Sciences here in Australia, Deloitte Economics Group as well. What do these reports tell us? These reports tell us that if you've got a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Communication, you are employable. And in fact, you're more employable than some of the STEM areas. Your starting salaries will be high as well, mm -hmm. higher than in some areas of the STEM message as well. So there's this funny cross-purpose of message going on here, which leads me to think that it is purely ideological. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the reality is that graduates with a BA or a BCom are employable, that they earn good money, and they're doing something that, you know, if, if you know, arts and humanities was their first choice, they're doing something they're going to be enjoying, presumably, as well. So... That's what we have to count on. I think we have to use that level of data mm. against the prevailing message to say that, no, 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 a, a good choice, in fact, is being made if you pursue a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Communication, that, that you will be employable. Don't listen to the prevailing nonsense. You will be employable and you'll, you'll have an opportunity for a creative and dynamic career. Um, now, most students resonate with that. You know, most students, you know, you know will, will get that message. It's then up to us once they're in the degree to, to relay to them that there is more to it than just employability. Um, yeah. Life is a whole lot more diverse and, and, you know, intricate and sophisticated than just matters of employability. But that's a good way, I think, just to counter that providing message that the stats tell us a BA, a BCom is a good investment as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as, as, as a final uh, remark, uh, Andrew, do you have anything else that you would like to add that, you know, I couldn't uh, ask you any comment, any, feed, uh, any sort of, you know, message to students, your students, or people, uh, you know, who are in general interested in humanities? I think it's just so important, and this, this will again sound like a cliche, I've been, been yeah. filled with cliches today, and I do apologise for that, but... Um, but uh, look, I, I think it's just so important that students, you know, particularly through, through the stresses of late high school when they're trying to make selections and the pressure that is put on young people to you know, identify a career path. And, and if you get it wrong, well, oh, you know, so that's not, you know, follow your heart. You know, if the humanities, if the arts, you know, communication, media, these things are where your interests are, follow them. You'll be looked after if you come to university and study these things you'll find that language, that same language that I found when I started. You'll, you'll find other people who are thinking in similar ways to you. You'll then sort of develop a, a sophisticated way of, of explaining and understanding the world around you, which then allows you and affords you that opportunity to write back to that world and also contribute to its future making. Mm -hmm. Now, that's crucial. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really exciting thing. So that, that's, that's something I'm, I'm sort of reminding my students of a fair bit especially my third year guys, as they're approaching into their degrees, they're thinking about what's next. Yeah. Uh, a few nerves and anxieties are sort of coming through there. But I, I, I just keep reminding them that, look, you know, just trust your instincts on this, trust your interests, follow your heart, um, and that, you know, in fact, the skills that you have are transferable, they're valuable, they can be applied in different ways in different settings. Um, enjoy the ride and just see what happens. And... That's a, um, in fact, that, that's a fairly revolutionary thing to say in this day and age, as it yeah. turns out. But yeah. um, unfortunately, that's sort of where we are. But, um, but yeah, it, it is, again, a good investment, not just in terms of employability and career-wise, but a good investment in terms of the self to, to study the fields that, that we're in. Mm. 
Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you a lot uh, for, uh, you know, uh, showing the audience or talking to the audience about, you know, the potential of the humanities in general in transforming uh, and, you know, the, the, the society and its social political, you know, like it, it could, like its potential to, um, you know, address and transform our societies. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I, I really appreciate you uh, being here and you know taking your time to discuss this. Um, it, it it has like I've always wanted to uh, talk to someone, um, especially from your context, because I've been reading a lot, quite a lot about uh, you know this uh, the government's engagement in the humanities and how it has you know, more or less affected as as the, the opinions say. Um, uh, the perception about the discipline. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, we will meet again. My pleasure, Thelen. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. We will meet again soon and we will have more things to talk about in a future episode. And uh, yeah, I wish you all the best for all your endeavors and I wish you uh, all the success in your, you know, um, the attempts that you make in order to, uh, you know, accommodate all the students, especially for simulation students, to facilitate their learning and all that. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Andrew. We'll meet again soon. Thanks, Yeah. A pleasure. Bye. Yeah, bye.